So they asked me to talk about something in machine learning or deep learning or something related to AI, which is a pretty broad request. Um, so I decided to talk about something that I really like, um, sequence to sequence learning using deep neural networks um, for two reasons. One reason is that it's cool. The other reason is that it's useful, although mostly because it's cool. We also have to make it useful because we work at Deloitte and we need to make money. So. Yeah, it needs to be useful as well. And this, there are very few things that are in the intersection of cool and useful. Um, so a lot of people can do something cool or spend nights on TensorFlow running some stuff, training on multiple GPUs. If you can sell that thing or put it in production somewhere, have somebody actually using it, it'll feel better, right? It'll feel like what you did was also impacted somebody in some way. At least I think so. Uh, sequence to what now and why do we care? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, what is sequence to sequence learning? So I'm going to restrict the talk to text. When I talk about sequence to sequence, I'm mostly going to be talking about sequential input, sequential output with text. In theory, I don't need to restrict myself to that. So in theory, um, the sequence, the computer really doesn't care what these numbers are. You can have sequences of many sort, and we can give a few examples afterwards. But as for, in the literature, it started off talking about text, and I'm going to stick to that. Um, so the goal is general. You want a sequential input and you desire a sequential output. It could be in a question and answer format, like who am I, and you expect some kind of return back, like you are something. It could be translation, so you input a sequence of words in English and you expect the sequential return to be in French. Um, it could be text summarization, so that sequence would be a longer sequence of text, like a paragraph or let's say multiple paragraphs, but you only want a few words to summarize what it is. Many examples. Um, you can also see sec to sec being used in ways that are, for example, um, you know, what if you don't want the entire paragraph back? So you ask Google a question like, when was Napoleon born or something like that? Um, it might return a paragraph containing some information that's relevant, or if it actually knows the answer, if it parses the answer, it'll just tell you the year. Right? So it's actually understood that you're looking for a particular thing. So looking at the token level uh, stuff it, as well as the sequence level stuff. Um, in the process of learning this transform, so sec to sec we basically want the machine to learn a transform from a in sequential input and produce a sequential output. We don't only just care about the output. We care about the process of the machine learning itself. Because as it learns, it usually um, produces what's called an embedding. So it learns to translate from the human tongue to machine tongue, which is numbers. So by embedding will usually mean a faithful numeric representation of the initial sentence. Something um, that if, let's say, simplistically, if two sentences were close to each other in meaning, you'd also kind of expect those two numeric vectors that it the machine says represent the sentence to be close to each other in Euclidean distance, for example. Um, we are going to try and quickly, it's a really rich field. So I really need to, I'm going to be really high level. But I want to give a brief overview of what, ha what happened in this field <clears throat> in the last just five years, because a lot has happened. Um, give an idea of the evolution of the papers and sort of where the ideas might have stemmed from and the motivation behind a lot of them. It's quick lingo. What's a neural net? Um, dots and arrows, for the most part. Um, circles with arrows. Someone told me that. Someone told me when you machine learning people talk about neural nets, you just start drawing circles and arrows, and you don't explain what you're doing. So um, for the most part, think of the circles, circles, I like to think of them, as just places where the computation happens. And the edges are a signal being sent from one node to another. And they're usually a weighted signal that explains to the next node what to do with the signal it's just received, how to weight it. The weights are learned. And this whole system of circles and arrows represents a mathematical transformation that has a particular format. And for the most part, you want the machine, you give the machine that format, that architecture, and you ask it to learn those weights to see conditional on my, my assumption of this architecture being correct, 
give me some weights that will cor correctly model the distribution that I'm interested in, uh, con usually conditional distribution of some output given, given an input. Uh, LSTM, for those of you who are, oh, rest in peace. Um, so this was the initial you know, success of sec to sec um, Really, LSTMs were, in 2014, first introduced. It's a type of neural net. This here is, this diagram is sometimes referred to as an unrolled um, recurrent neural net. So LSTMs are a type of recurrent neural net. By that, we mean they're autoregressive. Um, the same transform is applied using the output of um, the previous iteration, so it's recursive. Um, it does some, LSTMs were a type of recurrent net that gained popularity because of its ability to deal with long-term memory better than other networks. So you have a sequence of text, let's say we're talking about sequential data, it will rem and you keep feeding words in that sentence, it has a bypass mechanism that keeps track of the history better. Um, it lets you remember words that were further away because they're still relevant to the meaning of the sentence, right? Um, finally, transformers, that's kind of what's being used right now. Um, it doesn't have that sequential, let's check word number one and then check word number two and then check word number three. Uh, it's, as you will see, I'm going to put only one math equation because someone told me don't put it. I'm going to put only one math equation. As you'll see, there are much more straightforward matrix multiplication that occurs all at once on all tokens, uh, except during inference. Oh. <clears throat> So first paper I want to talk about is the birth of sec to sec, I'll call it. There is one before, but I'll call this one the birth of it. So it used an encoder decoder framework. So the basic idea of the encoder decoder framework is you start off with a sequence of text. Let's say my name is Omar. And you want the network to accept that as input and produce an embedding. Apply some mathematical transformations and you retrieve a, a numeric vector <clears throat> that's supposed to be representative of the meaning of that sentence, right? But in the machine's world. And then you want the decoder. So the decoder will say, okay, you've turned this from English to computer. Now, I'm not a computer, so turn it back to English for me, right? Um, this was the initial use case in, in, in this paper was translation, and it did extremely well, and it gave birth to a lot of the, like it's a, lot, it's a big impetus behind the evolution of uh, Siri and Alexa and Google Assistant and all of that. That technique did really well. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about how they did it. So the this thing might look a little weird. So here's what I meant by autoregressive. So this thing appears like it's multiple cells, multiple transforms. It's really, think of it as the same transform being applied to multiple tokens. So it's more like are you free tomorrow, All this entire thing hidden behind the LSTM structure is being applied to the word R. The output from that application is being fed again to the same transform, and then the word U gets put in, and you use the information from before to keep track of what happened so far. You don't want to process the token, one token at a time and forget what happened, because the sentence is not just a sum of the meanings of its words. I'll dance there a few exceptions. You know, in, for the most part, <laughs> the, the sentence deserves a contextual meaning of the, each word in the presence of all the other words in the sentence to get, a ga to get a proper comprehension. You get this embedding vector, which is the result of the machine's translation, and then you want to use that embedding vector to get something out. Um, this little picture has uh, a reply, but normally speaking, in, in, in this paper, it was translation. Now, one thing that I want to talk about is training details and how this thing is trained. So to train something like that, you need a lot of data. And I mean a lot, a lot of data. That's why it was out of reach for, for most people to train their own. They kind of depend on pre-trained transfer learning and, and whatnot. So this thing took 10 days on eight state-of-the-art GPUs at the time. And 2014 is an ancient. I mean, they were pretty good GPUs. Uh, it took 10 days with um, a lot of data. and they used a really massive structure. So it was a thousand neurons for the hidden state, eight layers of bidirectional LSTM, a lot going on. Now, the problem is, so let's say I train something like that. I keep feeding the word in and I get something out and I keep doing this and I learn some embedding vector. Um, by the time you come to inference, so here when I'm training it, I already know what the correct translation is gonna be so I can compare my, my network's output to the, to the desired output. 
But during inference, you don't know. So what they would do is take that entire meaning of the sentence independent of the sequence length, right? It has to be squashed in this fixed length embedding vector and try to decode word by word, um, which is called greedy decoding. So you, deco you take the embedding vector, you produce the word yes, right? And then you take the word yes and feed it to yourself again and say what's. But if you got word number one wrong, right? you propagate your error throughout. And so you continue getting, any, at any point when you make a mistake, it's gonna influence the evolution afterwards. So greedy decoding didn't work so well for them. So the, other, the next thing they tried was called beam search decoding, which is still popular. So beam search decoding, instead of looking at one token at a time, keeps track of the most likely sequences. Saying at each stage keeps track of, let's say top five hypotheses for sequences. Um, so instead of looking at like, one token at a time, it keeps track of here's my, you know, hypotheses for the most five likely um, sentences, right? And keeps updating this way so that it can at least keep some memory of what happened. Um, and basically, yeah, like you would train anything. It look, it, you, you go softmax cross, no, I shouldn't say that. You just compare the word that was produced by the LSTM to the word that you expect it to be and you see if it got it right or wrong and it learns from its mistakes and continues going. Yeah, so the challenges with, with vanilla, I kind of already talked about them. Um, so here are some problems. Um, the, the LSTM predicts one token at a time. Um, it, to correct that problem that I was talking about, instead of training it by giving it the embedding vector and then not helping it out in the decoding, what they try to do initially is kind of help it out by letting it cheat, but only slightly. So they don't let it see the word that it's currently trying to decode, but they feed it the ground truth value of the previous word so that it tries to, so instead of feeding it its own output, so that if, you know, it made a mistake right now during training, I can at least correct it in the next step and make sure that it's adjusted, right? It's not cheating because it's not seeing the word that it's trying to get at step three. It only sees the word that it, it only sees. So here, the desired output is, is, is va, but it only sees comma, for example. Um, yeah, we have no access to the true outputs. Took a long time. Vanilla is also challenging for a lot of other reasons, but this, this thing, I mean, eight GPUs, but if you do it on any regular machine, like if you try training, Sutskever's initial paper on your laptop, you're gonna be there till Armageddon. Don't try to do that. Um, attention, so attention is a really important evolution. So I know I mentioned one of the initial challenges of this whole encoder decoder approach of squashing the entire sentence into some fixed length vector is that you have no idea how long your sentence is going to be. It could be 50 words, it could be 100, it could be 200, but no matter what, you wanna squash its meaning into that, right? So that, open, that's basically the abstract of Badenau's, in, uh, Badenau's paper, that's the motivation. Uh, instead of squashing all this source sentence information into one vector, we let it peer into the word level embeddings. So to decide which, uh, which words in your source sentence are most relevant to translating or decoding what word you're currently trying to decode right now, right? So that way it allows it to dynamically choose a subset of the words in the source sentence, right? Whatever words are most relevant to what you're looking at right now, let's say I is the most relevant to de decoding the word J and focus more on that. And it's kind of like how your eyes just go into, when you were reading a paragraph, right? There are certain keywords that will catch your eye. That's sort of what attention mechanisms are. It's allowing this, this vector to capture how much should I care about each one of these particular words, given that I'm trying to, to get the word J, the first, the very first one, right? Um, it seems kind of intuitive after the fact, but it really improved accuracy. Um, and improved accuracy, especially with longer sentences. Um, so the initial paper was already doing quite well with, let's say 30 word sentences. But as you got higher and higher, the capacity of that single vector to capture the entirety of the meaning of the sentence became a little bit questionable. Um, attention spark was sparked there. Now, I didn't talk about the mathematical format of attention because there are many. Um, but for the most part, think of it as you would think of a correlation matrix. 
between the current word you're trying to do, word embedding you're trying to decode and all the other word encodings in the in the source sentence. Um, so this paper here still used the initial model, still used the initial LSTM encoder decoder framework. It just happened to put in this additional attention mechanism to 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 focus. It's, it's almost a plus on the addition, uh, a plus on the on the initial model. This paper, attention is all you need, went much further than that. Um, it said you don't need LSTM at all, actually. All you need is, is to have an attention mechanism to focus on the source, which source words are most relevant to decoding your current. But it used attention in two ways. It had a novel idea, really. Self-attention and target source attention. So we'll talk about self-attention. Self-attention is when we were talking about attention before, we were really talking about, given that I'm trying to translate the word je, how relevant is the word I to my current effort? Self-attention is different. It's given that I have this source sentence here, how are the words interacting with each other in the same sentence? I'm still at the encoder stage here. I'm still just trying to capture how each word correlates with every other one. And for the most part, if you see it coded, I mean, you'll just see matrix multiplication x times x transpose by itself, for the most part. Um, you need this additional layer of, of getting some representation of these words, of course, but then you just have them all interact and see what's the hot zones of interaction. What is this it? It's probably the animal, right? This it that, that's referenced in the sentence. And the information, of course, has to be contained within the same sentence. Um, it had multiple attention heads instead of a single one that allow you to train different weights for different ways to focus on the sentence, let's say. Let's put it that way. Uh, so instead of one person paying attention, we have multiple people with multiple viewpoints all deciding what are the most important things we should care about during, during our encoding, decoding. Um, now, when they, you basically do self-attention and then you pass it into an MLP and you normalize and do some other stuff, the other key point for the transformer architecture, which is nice, is that this is just matrix multiplication now. So now we can parallelize. There's nothing sequential going on in the encoder, right? We can just take all the embeddings for the current sentence that we're looking at, just make them all up, put them on the GPU, and it all goes really well, even though it's n squared. But practically speaking, with eight GPUs, you're going to go faster. Um, OK. Um, there is also, uh, if you guys are familiar with ResNet for images, so ResNet came up with this idea, which I, I thought initially was kind of silly. But as we've seen in practice, it can be hard for deep learning models to learn the identity transform. When I first looked at it, I thought, well, it's, you know, we have this all this muscle, and it can't learn f of x equals x. That's kind of silly. But no, it's hard. It's sort of hard to learn the identity transform. Um, so they allow this kind of pass through to say, instead of saying f of x, x equals you know f of x, I'm going to keep adding the new transform. So I'm going to say, instead of going the second layer as a function of my previous layer, I'm going to model it as x plus f of x. Because it's much easier to add that part, to drive that part to 0 than it is to train and, and, and find the identity transform. Um, they have that too in, in, in the transformer architecture. Um, pretty useful, actually. So it kind of, if you don't need that extra complexity, you won't use it, basically. Think of it that way. Um, it's deep. It's eight. It's um, six layers each, six layers encoder, six layers decoder, so 12 layers total, but still didn't take that much time. I think they changed it, changed it in three days. Um, yeah, I, I want to, every time I wanted to put an equation, I kept remembering this quote from, from Stephen Hawking, Hawking, where his publisher told him that it would have half your sales by Every single time you put an equation, just divide the sales by fifty uh, by, by two, and it'll be fifty percent. However, I just think attention is so important to what we do practically every day, but also to this field that I wanted to put that one equation, which I think is kind of nice. The reason I think this is nice is not because I, I really love matrix multiplication or I think matrix multiplication is deep or anything. Um, it's because LSTMs are so complicated. I can explain this in a much easier way to anybody, right? Uh, then it would take me, if I were to explain the LSTM to you, take the remainder of the time that I have, because the complexity of the mathematical transform, well, so, theoretically you can explain it in, in a few words, but the complexity of the mathematical transform and the different gates and why this one uses hyperbolic tan versus sigmoid and et cetera, would take a long time. Uh, attention is sort of, so has a query, a key, and a value. 
self-attention query key and value would all be the same matrix, a matrix of embeddings. So it would have sequence length by embedding size. Think of the embedding size as the length of the vector needed to represent that word. And then you would just take x, multiply it by x transpose, normalize it a little bit, different ways of normalization, and just take a weighted sum of the initial vector and that's self-attention. It's much easier than LSTMs, I think. Um, multiple attention heads pretty much do that a lot. Uh, multiple times at least and concatenate them. Okay, so some nice things about transformers and why they were nice in this field. First of all, now I'm treating all the sequence length equally, right? So LSTMs were good with long-term memory because they allow things to pass from the beginning to the end. But you lose a little bit. I mean, by the time you go to, from token, zero, token one to token 50, you've lost a lot of information about token one. This one is sort of just taking everything together. I mean, it's taking every, all the sequence length from one to whatever it is and doing X times X transpose. It captures long range dependencies much better, which was Vasfani's initial, initial point. Um, second thing is now we have a problem. Uh, in the LSTM, I had this sequential order, so I can know this word came after this word and this word came after this word, et cetera. Now I'm sort of just taking a matrix and multiplying it by itself. What's word number one? What's word number two? Where am I capturing this? So uh, the authors had this idea of position embeddings, which is just one more additional vector to capture the position of the word in the sentence, and more accurately, the relative position of words to each other. Um, you do multi-headed attention, add and normalize. This add part is the ResNet thing I was talking about. Basically, every time you do a transform, you add it to the previous layer rather than just taking the transform directly so that you have the option of driving it to zero much easier using stochastic gradient descent than you would otherwise. Um, feed forward neural network, add and normalize. Notice nothing really complicated going on. We get to this part, and my first idea was, well, how are you not cheating if you feed it the output embedding, right? By output embedding, it's really the ground truth. So if you're trying to translate, it would feed it the words in French that it's trying to get. So isn't that just cheating by looking at the... Um, so he uses this masking mechanism of a lower triangular matrix, uh, which basically only allows each word to look at the words so far. Basically replicating what we had talked about in LSTM, but more on a matrix multiplication level. Um, yeah, no cheating. Yeah, greedy beam decoding still applies. Basically, this is what we do now. Um, the latest things that you hear about are using one variation or another of this. Yeah, so this is, this is my favorite thing in the world. So BERT uh, is, stands for Bidirectional Encoder Representation from Transformers. Um, it's, as the authors write in the code comments, if you read the code, this is a copy paste from, this is pretty much identical to Vaswani, except for one important point. Um, even though the model architecture is very, very similar, almost identical to the initial transformer that we talked about, Bert has came up with this new idea. Instead, the, the initial idea behind all the models that we talked about was we want to see if this thing learned English. We're going to teach it English, right, let's say. So we're going to see if it can predict the next word. We're going to go word by word. We're going to read left to right and go one word at a time. And if it can predict the next word, then it's understood the language because it knows what, what word is coming up. That was the basic idea. BERT trained the model a bit differently, um, unsupervised. So it said, OK, I am not going to feed you the entire sentence and try to translate to an embedding and get the same sentence back. Instead, I'm going to play fill in the blanks. So I'm going to randomly remove 15% of the tokens. And if you've understood the sentence, you're going to be able to fill them in correctly. That's the basic idea, right? So like, yeah, exactly like fill in the blanks like they do in those reading comprehension tests. Uh, and yeah, and that's what they did. So it was it's a simple idea, simple change to the previous things, but that combined with a lot of computing power, combined with 24 layers, combined with the fact that they trained on every English word, like all of Wikipedia has 4 billion tokens, all of book corpus, and they added one other thing I forgot. Um, they, they, there's no more text you can give Bert. Bert knows English at this point, right? so yeah. Uh, it's just an encoder. Um, so Bert goes to the point where, so note that if we were to do this bidirectional thing in actual and, and stare at the output embeddings, we'd be just straight up cheating, right? Like we 
we'd just be seeing all the words that are we're supposed to get and et cetera, and we wouldn't be able to apply that same framework. Um, from an unsupervised perspective, this is this is the you know, maybe there's somebody using it with, with maybe there somebody can attach the decoder. I can easily think of a, of ways I think to to put it, but it, we're really talking about the encoder right now, and, and some sticklers can say, well, it's not sec to sec, that's just sec two, and then period. But we'll talk about that. Uh, Okay, so the weird thing about BERT is it's used for a million different things, and they didn't really spend a lot of effort, so they just did an unsupervised pre-training. Basically gave it all of Wikipedia, took all the tokens out, and they said, well, fill in the blanks, fill in the blanks forever, and then it reached this huge thing with, with a lot of weights trained and everything. And then they just started feeding it NLP tasks, like one after the other. You know, each one of these, if you break a benchmark on one of them, you'd publish a paper, right? But they, they just fed it all of them. Um, so the sentence pair classification task. So sentence one, sentence two. Let's say you're interested in whether sentence one is related to sentence two, what, whether sentence one is before sentence two, whether sentence two and sentence one together, I don't know, whatever. Is it sentence two is the next stanza of poetry after se sentence one, whatever. They feed it sentence one, set token, sentence two, and they get a label. Like, is next sentence true, is next sentence false, et cetera. Same thing with uh, classification tasks. So let's say you have a particular paragraph and you want to say, you want to classify it as angry, um, this paragraph is happy, this paragraph is sad, whatever. Single, single target, kills all the benchmarks. Question and answering tasks is, is, is an interesting one, squad. Um, so you might, this is, we're not talking about open domain question and answering where you also ask the AI to search a huge corpus for paragraphs container. We're just talking about given a, a paragraph, like reading comprehension like you would in school, given a paragraph, and the question about this paragraph, give me the answer, assuming the answer is found in the, in the paragraph that we just gave. So squad, it does really well in that too. Squad V1.1, that's the differentiated between that and squad V2.0, which allows the AI to give the answer, I don't know, because sometimes uh, the answer is not found in the, in the paragraph. Um, it does significantly worse, and all machines do significantly worse on that second type. That's why squad 2.0 was left, but they later fine-tuned it and did quite okay on that. And uh, named entity recognition, so names of people, organizations, et cetera, start token, end token, all that. Um, that's pretty much where we're at right now, is people use transfer learning. So because no one has the time nor energy to experiment with a million different variations of a network that big and train it on Wikipedia for a year, um, we leverage the pre-training that already happened, and then in practice, you'd fine-tune it to a wide variety of tasks, whether your task is sentence classification, whether it's named entity recognition, whether it's whatever you like, you basically, that's basically what's going on these days. Um, and yeah, I went really fast, I know, but I don't know, I'll go over. Okay, any questions? <laughs> 